scriptures, open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. This morning we will pick up in verse 1 and work to verse 4. Striving together to preserve Christ glorifying unity inside of the church. Striving together to preserve Christ glorifying unity inside of the church. Would you bow with me as I pray? God, our Father, as we now have our Bibles opened, make our hearts and ears attentive. Lord, please help us to resist the distractions that so quickly crowd into our minds. And let us give you these few moments together. Lord, in the serious hearing of the word that we will be doers of it, I pray for myself as a preacher. God, without you, I am nothing, and I need your power and your spirit to preach in a manner that you are pleased with, in a manner that the body of Jesus will be edified in, and that unbelievers might even be convicted. I pray for my brothers who are preaching elsewhere. God, fill these men as well with your spirit and your power. Give us favor with your people. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. If you're familiar with Paul's letter, known as 1 Corinthians, you might recall from the early portion of that letter, Paul is dealing with division. Division amongst believers. People who believe that Jesus is the Christ. Sinless, the Lamb of God who died, was buried, raised, has ascended, is coming back. They are convinced of that truth. They're at least a good many of them, we know in 1 Corinthians 15, there were some who were starting to struggle with that, at least one portion, a major portion. But very, very early in the letter, he talks about the division, and here's how it was characterized. There were those who were saying, I follow Paul. Others, I follow Apollos. Well, I follow Cephas. And then, of course, you had that holier-than-thou group who said, well, I follow Christ. And I know you're thinking, no, that's the good group. Well, it would be if they had the right attitude. But these are the ones who were like, well, we've got you all beat because our loyalty is to Jesus. While Jesus would be standing there going, I don't know who your loyalty to is, but it isn't me. So don't throw my name in there. But how might that read if the Apostle Paul were alive today and was addressing the church today? Just, just follow this with me. And I'm certainly not trying to rewrite Scripture. I'm not trying to add to it. But just imagine with me for a moment if Paul addressed the church today. It might go like this. Some of you are saying, I follow MacArthur. Others, I follow Piper. Still others, well, I follow Keller. And of course, that pharisaical group, well, I follow Christ. Again, we should be able to be in that category of I follow Christ, but the attitudes that Paul is describing here are rotten. They're simply saying that to look better by comparison. Now you'll notice the names that I picked. I started with MacArthur because some people could call me a MacArthurite, except we're not together on every issue. He's wrong on some things. <laughs> I don't know that. I, I, I have come to some different conclusions, conclusions in areas where I think there is liberty to do so. And I say that with, with due respect to the man that I have benefited from greatly. Why does the church in 2023 continue to make the same mistakes that were made in the church in Paul's day? <laughs> Likely one word could be at the very heart of the answer. Self. Self. April and I were generously and graciously gifted the opportunity to attend the G3 conference in Atlanta this past week. And it's exhausting. If you don't believe me, ask April, ask Leslie, ask Kennedy, ask John, ask Ashley, ask 8,400 other people that you don't know. It's rich, but exhausting. Oh, you poor suffering saints. No, no, I'm not trying to sound whiny. But something 
that I noticed even during the conference when we were on break I would check the Twitter verse and I saw how even what I think was intended to be a good conference and people who do know the gospel blasting the speakers not to say that the speaker I'm not in alignment with everything every speaker said and they wouldn't be in alignment with me on everything but just the it's like this mad dash to to take one word or one phrase that doesn't compromise the gospel but but let's get it out there and let's just begin to fight my heart ached I talked to one of my dear friends in in Christ before we went to the conference and I said I am growing so tired of my own selfishness I am growing so sad in watching the the I believe the true church of God just fighting each other and don't worry I've not grown liberal overnight I understand that there are serious differences even within the true and professing church the folks some of these battles are battles that we're making our, ourselves they just are we're, we're throwing fuel on them and and the outside world looks in and goes you all are a joke and you're this is the worst part and your so-called savior is a joke do you see why I might have wanted to shift the Lord's Supper to the end <laughs> Because I think this needs to be a sobering reminder that there is a call from God through Paul, not only to the Philippian saints, but to the saints in every generation, that we will either strive against one another or with one another. But we are to strive with one another, together in battle against an opponent, to preserve Christ's glorifying unity, the unity that he himself produced in the church, not in the world, but in the church. I remind you in Philippians chapter 1 verses 27 through 30 we looked at this last week Paul is inferring the persecution that is there and that will come believers should expect this but who is going to be bringing that persecution the outsiders the unbelievers the opponents of the gospel that's who you should expect persecution from don't try to be friends with them. I'm not saying that we don't engage the, the fallen world. We do. We not only protect and, 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 and prepare, but we actually have to go into battle at times. We're not becoming friends with the world, but we are taking the good news of God to the world. They don't want it. They don't like it. And they will push back. They will attack. But then he shifts in chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, to point out the need that believers have and the responsibilities that we have to keep from dividing ourselves. One of the most useful, unfortunately, tactics of the enemy is to get the body of Christ divided against themselves before they even step onto the battlefield. He does that. Not that God won't win. God is, he's already won. But God works through means and wants to display to the world that, that he saves the people for his own namesake, his own possession. And he works through those people to get glory for his name. And he takes sinners, saves them, and makes them a unit. But when we divide ourselves, we are actually hindering the means that God wants to use. And will use. Folks, he will advance his kingdom. We will either go gladly or we will be drugged by the hair of the head. Philippians 2, 1 through 4 is a serious call about preserving unity from within. There's only four verses this morning. I've subtitled this, two main points. Resist division in the church, number one, by being of the same mind. And we've got to look at what that means. What doesn't that mean? But be of the same mind. Look at verses one and two of Philippians 2. 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. There's a presupposition by Paul here regarding the work of Jesus in his people, in the church. He begins with this conditional participle, if. And there's multiple words that can be used there. The one he uses is just two little letters, epsilon, iota. Typically meaning that it introduces circumstances necessary for a given proposition to be true. But I think that this is actually a bit rhetorical where Paul would say, these things will be true if you know Christ. Amen. If you know Christ, what I'm about to say must be true. And here the if, or the if statement attached to four proposed circumstances. Listen to them. Number one, if there is any encouragement in Christ. For the believer, is there any encouragement in Christ? Yes. It's not even a debate. It speaks of the encouragement, the building up in faith that comes from Jesus to and for his people. It's concrete. Second, if there is any comfort from love, referring to the comfort that Christ gives to his people, empowered by his own love for them. Even when we are not rightly loving Jesus, he is always rightly loving us. Amen. Thanks be to God because I don't always rightly love Him. And I don't say that just, you know, like it's not a big deal. God has loved me and is loving me and will love me perfectly at all times and in all things, even when I'm not loving Him rightly. Third, if there's any participation in the Spirit, speaking of the reality of the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit in every single believer, but the picture is the collection of believers known as the church, the community of believers. It's more about His presence and power at work in them, emphasizing the community over the individual. <coughs> Not to say that there aren't individual believers, but we were saved individually to be a part of a community. The idea that some people have that they can faithfully serve Jesus on their own apart from the church is unbiblical. And when you throw those, well, what about the person who is in a nursing home? You're talking about a, certain, a situation that's not normative, and that's where the church goes there. I'm talking about the person who has been convinced or has convinced him or herself of this. I can worship Jesus just fine and rightly on my own apart from you people. No, you can't. You can't. Not only will you not, you can't do that rightly. This emphasizes the community of believers rather than only the individual. And then fourth, if there is any affection and sympathy, affection has the idea of these strong inward emotions. The way they would have said it was to say, oh, I have deep love for you in my kidneys. When's the last time you picked up a Hallmark card that wanted to express to your wife or your husband on Valentine's Day, oh, you mean so much to me in my kidneys. What? It's a picture of the seedbed of our emotions and the depths, and it might seem odd to us, but not to them. Sympathy is the display of care and concern that fellow believers have for other believers in their difficulties. And if you say, well, I don't have the gift of mercy, you don't have to have the spiritual gift of mercy. This is to be characteristic of every single believer. Why? Because Christ has a compassion for you in your difficulties. And because of that, you and I can have compassion for one another in your difficulties. This is ripping the self out of us. Not that we're not still individuals. We are uniquely made in God's image. But, but so many want to make it only about, well, this is what I want. This is what I think. I, I can do this. I don't need you all. God didn't tell you that. God didn't tell you that. Well, I read a book by a theologian. Huh? I'm sure you did. If his name wasn't Jesus, you might want to consider questioning that book. And I'm not against books. I have plenty. 
the point of these realities is to draw the believers closer together in Christ. To remind the individual believer to be focused on the good of the community of believers over that of their own personal interests. Well, Daryl, you don't understand. I just don't get along with people like you do. How do you know I get along with people? I'm at a conference that is rich in theological teaching, and I'm standing there going, would you people learn how to move? Well, y'all, did everybody want to come into this hallway? I, I was leaving. April and I were in a breakout session. And the next one coming in was all is for women. So I'm just the dude standing there. And the women are looking at me like, I guess you're wanting out of me. Yeah, I do. They just kept on coming. I'm like, what's wrong with you people? That's what I wanted to say, but I didn't. I get frustrated just like you do. It's not easy. It takes work. I need to get out of here. And they're saying, well, I need to get in there. Well, my needs are greater than your needs. Really? Who said so? Me? Because... I'm the king of my kingdom. And I think the Lord's just laughing, not laughing at my sin, but going, how's it going? Because I stood there, what, maybe seven, eight minutes? I did. I just stood there like, as soon as y'all, I'm, I'm going to go Moses on you because I was bigger. I could just knock you all down. But there was a baby in the way, so I didn't want to do that. I thought it might draw a scene. <laughs> Well, we got to get in there. The, the breakout session is going to start. Well, you know what? If you'd let this beast of a man get out of your way, you'd have more room. It was still good. It was still good. If you're familiar, familiar with the language used pre-modernity, modernity, and post-modernity, you might understand that that was used to describe movements and, and ideas in, in the ages where the church has been bought by Christ for Christ we would fit into the category of pre-modernity where it was much more about the community rather than the individual but when you go from pre-modernity to, to modernity then you start seeing the self take the stage more and, and the doubt and then by the time you get to post-modernity it's all about the self now we're past that but does anyone want to argue with me that there's not an overwhelming majority of people who are all about self? I didn't get my way. I'm sure you didn't. It's so easy because that's our default. That's our disposition. We have to fight against it. There's this consumerism in the mindset of the people of God. Well, we're, we're looking for a church. You are, yeah. What are you looking for? Well, we're looking for, and I'm like, no, wait, are you looking for a church or a gym membership? Okay. Well, we want this, and we want this. Okay, Goldilocks. Here's a little news flash for you. It's not out there. It's not out there. I love what MacArthur says about looking for a church. Here I am. I'm a MacArthur. You want to look for a church? Here's the first and primary question that you ask. How do they handle the book? Well, they're, they're pretty solid on their teaching, but they don't offer a... Uh -uh. How do they handle the book? Because if they don't handle the book right, I don't care about how, quote, good all of these things are. But the consumerism and the consumerism mindset of... Well, I'm looking for this, and I'm, the porridge is going to be too hot, too cold. It's never going to be just right for you. And you're going to jump from here to here to here to here. And you might overlook that there's a common denominator in the problem that it's not that the porridge isn't hot enough or cold enough or just right enough. It might be you. Oh, it couldn't be me, because I know as myself, I've got it right. I think Paul is pushing back on that. He has an expectation of believers. In verse 2, speaking of his desire to grow closer to them. He is not content with simply planting the church there and then leaving them and barking commands at them from a distance. He says, I want close intimacy with you. I am your friend. I am your brother in the Lord. I want to know you and I want you to know me. I want to grow with you. And he says, complete my joy. Complete my joy. Back in chapter 1, verses 4 and 25, Paul talked about how he prayed for them and had joy in doing so and how he is content to stay on the earth longer even though he wants to go home and be with the Lord. It, it is better for you if I stay. That's, that's a delight. That's joy. And I'm willing to do it. 
I want to have full joy regarding you particular believers. The well-known apostle desires to have deeper friendships with believers regardless of whether they are people of renown or not. Well, Paul, I'm, I'm no one of substance. I, I don't get invited to speak at conventions or anything. I don't care. You're my brother. You're my sister in Christ. I want to know you because of that. And I don't want you to see me as the super apostle and as the superhero because I'm not that. I'm your brother. And I have weakness. I battle sin just like you do. And I need you and you need me. I want to know you. Because that's what Jesus wants of us. That's what He wants. If we will want this together, that's what will make our joy complete. And the way that the Philippian believers would complete Paul's joy were by these means. Number one, this is in verse 2, be of the same mind. And this is talking about being of the same mind concerning the gospel. Being of the same mind does not believe that you, or does not mean that you agree on every absolute particular. But we cannot differ on the gospel. And there are some others, but the gospel is the main drive in Paul's mind. We strive together, even with particular differences, to seek the same goal, to be like-minded. We Number two, we have the same love. That is the love that Christ has for us, we have for Him, and we have for one another. Why do I love you? Because Jesus loves you. Well, Daryl, if you knew me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't love me. You would find it difficult. Friend, I'm difficult to love, unfortunately. I don't, I don't say that with any glee. I want to be easy to love. I want to be easy to love, but I'm not always easy to love. Third way that the believers would complete Paul's joy would be by being in full accord and of one mind. It, it has the idea of we're of one soul. Our, our individual collection of souls are knitted together. We're of one mind, one soul. <laughs> And you might have guessed, this takes a lot of work. I used to think that I was going to be that husband who wouldn't have to give those stories of how hard it is. But now I'm getting that right. You know, wedding day comes, I get married. I'm seriously thinking about writing the book for other couples and how their marriages can be strong. You know, day two, I'm like, well, maybe the book's not just ready. And by day three, I'm like, I'm in no place to write a book on this. Didn't take long for me to figure it out. I have work to do. It's continual work to strive together rather than against each other. Even when we're on the same side. So consider your brothers and sisters in Christ in whom you are confident that they do hold to the gospel. There's your starting point. There's your starting point. Being of the same mind with these fellow believers does not mean that you agree on every issue, but that you are united on the main issue. <laughs> And commit to striving together for the advance of the gospel and trust God to help you in bearing with one another in your differences that do not compromise the gospel. <clears throat> Something that I'm seeing is that we get in these huddles. We get in these huddles. I'll just let you know that I'm one who holds to the younger earth view, and I know that not everyone in this building does, so please don't get mad at me. I love you. But I do. I hold to the that view I was listening to Ken Ham yesterday and, and I, I like him I don't always like everything he says and I'm like eh, I'm not, I don't know if I'm with you and, and he gets pushed back from some pretty good theologians but overall and especially on Genesis 1 through 11 I'm like I'm with you bro so I'm in my huddle here I'm like all right young earth people let's all, let's all huddle oh man Woo, we're together yeah those old earth people look at them over there yeah let's huddle let's huddle uh, and then one of them goes hey I heard something that not everyone in our huddle is a dispensationalist I'm like yeah, I'm not like, oh, get out of our huddle I'm like, ah crud so I go over and I'm like I need young earth a uh, historic pre-meal huddle like, we're, we're over here I'm like all right oh, we're huddled up all right we're, 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 we're together
together and and uh, man it's good to be with you guys we, we agree and somebody goes hey just be on the lookout there's some Calvinists in here I'm like yeah I'm one of those I'm like, get out of our huddle like, and so I'm looking for more huddles and, and the options are getting smaller and smaller to where I'm going to have to realize something I'm going to have to figure out a way one of my closest friends and I'm talking a brother that I would go to war with does not hold to the view I hold to on the age of the earth and he is rock solid theologically I don't like that he's not with me when I say I don't like it I just don't see his view and some of you are going well Darrell I'll be more than happy to give you a but folks I'm not let's not do that let's strive together it, people sometimes they'll be like, well Darrell have you read this no I'm just clueless on everything I just kind of picked a position I'm like look I didn't land here I got here and you didn't get here and I'm not mad at you and, and, and if you send me articles from whatever coalition or whatever conference I'll read them and I'm probably still going to come to this conclusion well, I just, I can't mentor a pastor who doesn't have my view. Good luck. Good luck. In this congregation, let's just think about this for a moment. I know that there are young earth people and old earth people. I know that there are premillennialists and amillennialists, if not postmillennialists. I know that. So what do we do? We just, well, let's plan, let's plan another Grace Fellowship where those who hold to these get to go, but these go to this one. Is that what we do? Or do we figure it out? Because, folks, there's a real war out there. And I got news for you. If I'm getting pummeled by unbelievers, the first way, if you come along and say, Darren, I'm right here with you. Well, are you a historic pre -mill? No. Well, I got it on my own. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be like, get in here, brother. Help me out. When I lived in Idaho for the summer in 1999, the pastor of the church that I was at, and we, we have significant differences, uh, and I love him. Man, do I love him. But he said, Daryl, where we are in Idaho, half of the state is nothing as far as religious affiliation. They're just like, we're nothing. Agnostic, atheist, whatever. We don't care. But of the half that is, 98% is Latter-day Saint or Mormon. We who are not that have to figure out ways to combat them. Why? Because they are in every political office. They make everything difficult. I lived there while they were trying to build a church building. And so the city commission was making every permit difficult. He said, we've got to figure out a way, even with some theological differences, to come together and combat so as to put Christ before the people. And this is not some water it down and just get along. But folks, you're going to have to take a serious look. And I'm going to have to take a serious look within myself. Am I striving to serve Jesus with you? Am I charitable in my thinking toward you even when I differ with you in things that I can differ with you on? Our huddles are going to get smaller and smaller if we don't do that. And here's the real sad part. Then we begin to demonize those that we differ with. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Well, such and such holds to this. Yeah, he does. And, you know, I don't, I don't see that perspective. Well, I don't even know if he's saved. Really? I heard him preach the gospel, and he got it exactly right. Yeah, but if he really knew it like I knew it, then he would agree with me. Oh, what was that thing I warned you about at the very beginning? The S-E-L-F? Self? Better watch that stuff, folks. If y'all think I've gone soft, I haven't. I have not gone soft. And I'm just watching the fight. And we're not even fighting the enemy. We're fighting each other on so many things. Well, I'm thinking about joining Grace Fellowship, or at least going through that prospective members class. But these are my criteria. Well, we don't, we don't force that. Well, then I won't join here. Okay. I'm not mad at you. But I'm not, I'm not playing around either. How charitable are you willing to be with fellow brothers and sisters who are truly fellow brothers and sisters who have some significant differences with you? Keep that in mind. Second of all, how to resist division in the church. Look out for one another. Look out for one another. Verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, 
But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. You and I have to kill rivalry and conceit. And the weapon that we use is humility. Not self-help manuals. But the weapon, and it sounds weird to call humility a weapon, but in this case it is, to kill rivalry and conceit is to use the weapon of humility. Not faux humility, where we pretend to be humble, but real humility. Verse 3, Paul commands the believers to refrain from doing anything. Boy, that's strong. Don't do anything from rivalry or conceit. Rivalry is selfish ambition. It's the attitude that seeks glory for the self over and above that of Christ and of his people. You might remember back in chapter 1, verses 15 through 18, Paul preached the gospel and, and spoke of men who preached the gospel. Some preached it out of the right motivation, the love for Christ, but some had the motivation to preach the true gospel to harm Paul. Why? Selfish ambition, rivalry, envy. Rivalry, folks. Why would you consider a brother or sister in Christ a rival? I'll tell you why. Because you want glory for yourself. That's why. That's why. Conceit is what is birthed by rivalry. It has the idea of empty glory. And the person or persons who seek glory for themselves actually think that they achieve glory. But it's an illusion. An illusion of glory. A phony glory. And they're content with it, unfortunately. And the primary way that people arrive at conceit is by putting others down so as to build themselves up like heroes. If people thought like I thought then they would be where I am. And I'm God's gift to the church to help those little peasants get to the level that I have arrived at. Woo! <coughs> wow! Now you're starting to see, even though we're in Philippians, not Corinthians, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. Why Paul would say, what are you doing? What are you doing? The glorious king of kings gave his life to rescue us, so this is what we would do? No. There's only one hero in the story, folks. And his name is Jesus. And that's not Sunday school speech. That's right theology. There's only one hero. Do not compete against him. And when you compete against fellow believers, you are in essence competing against Christ. When the Lord addressed Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he said, why do you persecute? Do you remember what he said? Why do you persecute me? Oh, I'm not persecuting you. I'm, per I'm persecuting people of the way. In effect, you're persecuting me. When you have rivalry against your family in Christ, you might as well see, say, Jesus, I have a rivalry against you. What believer is going to knowingly say that and not be broken in their, sin, in their heart and confess their sin and turn from it? Okay, so we have to kill rivalry and conceit by humility, not false humility. We see one another as made by God in God's image. People with value. People whom He has saved. This is not self-loathing. This is not pretend humility. When people have to tell you, well, you know how humble I am. No, I don't. You just killed it. Oh God, keep me humble. <laughs> What'd you do? You thought you were. Will you keep me humble? We haven't even got you there. Oh, but I am. Why? I, I have references. Now, they're all from myself. And uh, they're my standards. <laughs> but I've got references to speak of my humility, Lord. Stop doing 
that? No. No. You think you're humble? You're not even close. You're not even close. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to get to verse 5 of chapter 2. We're going to see humility. And we're going to measure our humility to Jesus. We'll see how close we are. I'm pulling for you and for myself. I just, I, I, I doubt we're there. But not self loathing, not phony humility, real humility. God, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I am made in your image and for your glory. He is made in your image and for your glory. She is made in your image and for your glory. God, help me to see them and see myself as you see us. But not to the point that I think that, well, we have arrived and others haven't. We haven't arrived yet, folks. How do we count one another as more significant than ourselves? By paying careful attention to the interest of other believers not only our own interest. It doesn't mean that we can't have interest. But we're not going to kill people who don't have those same interests. And we're not going to talk behind the back of the people that we don't have the same interest as. Paul is not promoting a devaluing of self. Rather, he is calling believers to prioritize that which God has as priority. It is a reorienting of your thinking. It's a change of how you think, taking you from your default and saying, I don't have to do that anymore. By the power of Christ, I don't have to do that. We know how to think selfishly. <laughs> That's easy. You look at two little babies who are finally learning how to say the words, you know, and 19 toys all around them. They've got one, and, and this other kid comes and, and, and gets one and says, Mine! Well, we know selfishness. That's easy. That's default. The work of reorienting your thinking to thinking of others is more important than yourselves takes serious, prayerful work. If it came naturally, would Paul have to command it? Notice that. Verse 3. Do nothing. Does that sound suggestive or like a command? I'll give you a hint. It's a command. Let each of you look not only to his own interest. That's a command. If it were easy, he wouldn't have to command it. But he knows that it isn't easy. I've already alluded to this, but when we get to verse 5 of chapter 2, we're going to see the humility of Jesus in coming, taking on human flesh. Striving to preserve Christ-honoring unity within the congregation is difficult. Because of that disposition of selfishness and self-seeking glory, it's a battle. So we have to consistently resist the constant temptation to seek our own interest and to seek glory for ourselves. And it is only by the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that we can and will see victory in this fight. Thankfully, God indwells His people and we have the tools that we need. We do. To my family in Christ, you know, there was sin before Adam and Eve sinned. There was sin in heaven. When an angel thought that he could get the glory that only goes to God. Selfishness. But there in the garden, you mean I'll be as wise as God? Really? Huh. I like that. Selfishness. Pride. It's consistent through the ages. Even the disciples of Jesus, whom he had been with close to three years, actually about three, about three years by this time, Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over. I'm going to be beaten. And I'm going to be crucified. They're going to bury me, but I'm going to rise from the dead. And, and during that speech... Do you want to know what the, the disciples are arguing about? Which one of us will be greatest in the kingdom? Can you imagine hearing the Lord of glory tell you, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem, man, and they're going to hand me over, and they're going, to, they're going to beat me worse than an animal. They're going to just shred my body. And they're going to hang me on a cross naked. And it's going to be one of the most brutal scenes you've ever seen, if not the most brutal. They're going to kill me there, okay? That's going to happen. 
Who do you think is going to be greatest in the kingdom? What? What? If they battle with selfishness, we're going to battle with it too. But again, as discouraging as that is, we're not defeated in this, folks. We don't have to lose this fight. God has equipped us with everything that we need to strive with one another against the real opponents. Instead of seeking glory for ourselves. So take some time in these next few hours and these next few days to go before the Lord in His Word and ask Him, Lord, reveal to me how there might be rivalry in me. God, if there's rivalry, then I know it's birth to conceit. And God, that, there's a lack of humility. And if you're thinking, well, I don't need to do that because I don't have rivalry and conceit, you above all people need to. Ask God to help you see fellow believers as He sees them. And if there are deficiencies, and there will be, then pray for God to make them strengths. And don't think that you don't have them either. Be of one mind and of one soul. Look out for one another. Preserve the unity that Jesus has produced. An unbeliever knows selfishness as well as we know selfishness. See, the problem from your perspective, though, is that you see selfishness as a virtue. It's how I get what I want. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. I'm my own non-binary whatever. I am selfish and I'm glad about it. Yeah, that's, that's a significant problem. Because selfishness is no virtue. It will be the death of you. And if you saw Jesus for who He truly is and yourself for who you truly are, you could not enjoy your selfishness. I pray that God open your eyes to see exactly that. And that selfishness that you have used as a means to get what you want will actually be a weapon used against you to break you and to bring you to your knees to cry out to God to save you. That's what I hope for you. That's what you hope for me? Yes. Because I would rather God break you and bring you to your knees and to Himself than to let you live 10, 20, 30, 50, 60 more years for yourself, your glory, and die and go to hell. I pray that God would do that for you. You're welcome. Let's pray. God in heaven. <coughs> As I preach this today, I am not preaching at the people of Grace Fellowship. I am preaching to people, and I am one of the recipients of this message. God, I have my own selfish desires, my own self-seeking glory. Um, I need you to help me in this, Lord. And Lord, help us to be wise to know the difference between being charitable in our thinking, and, but approving that which should never be approved either. There's so much here, God, and, and we're not going to make it without you. So we start with that. We admit that we need you, Lord. Not only did we need you to save us, but we need you to sanctify us. We need you to grow us. We need you to grant to us wisdom. We cannot make it on our own. I pray that that will be a glad confession where, God, we admit that we need the glorious Christ to do this work in us. Oh, God. Would you make the people of Grace Fellowship a humble people who strive together for the advancement of the gospel, who are charitable in our thinking with, toward one another, even with particular differences, to be a people who look out for one another, not only ourselves. And God, I pray that you would give us opportunities to talk to the unbelievers who are selfish, but Lord, to make it so plain and so clear that Christ is their only hope. Lord, would you do these things? I am confident that you are willing. Lord, please grow us. Grow us, grow us, grow us for your good pleasure and even our good. Amen.